Good morning. Really cool to have you all here. I hope your day is going well. The weather's outside is beautiful, so thank you for being inside with me. Uh, this week, Friday, if you have lab on Friday, or Wednesday, if you have lab today, class presentations are the big thing. And at the time of your class presentation, have your paper ready to turn in. You'll also turn in the special lab, which hopefully won't be too crazy for you, and you'll give your class presentation. Uh, we don't have a lab afterwards, we don't have a problem set or quiz, so it shouldn't be too bad or anything like that, and I definitely am looking forward to your presentations. There's a form you'll fill out during the presentations, but I'll give that form to you, and that's not hardcore or anything either. Um, any questions? That kind of stuff. Yeah. So we don't have a lab today? No lab today. That's right. Yeah. So especially in your section, it won't take too long. So this Friday for us? Yeah, that's right. So in your case, John Kalen's Wednesday, but all the rest of you would be Friday and stuff. Yeah. And there's no lab afterwards, so once the presentations are given, good to go. You'll turn in the special lab from last week. Um, turn in your paper. Other questions on that? Awesome. We're going to finish this chapter today. Um, the last big part of this is on uh, is on complex ions. And complex ions, super important in science, because when they form, there's often really mysterious circumstances. So you saw in the Shotley's principal lab, you were making zinc-2 hydroxide really insoluble, and all of a sudden, it disappeared. <laughs> and chemists were really tripped out by this for a long time until they realized there's a lot of these heavily product-favored complex ions that form. It's a Lewis acid with a Lewis base. A Lewis acid is something that can accept a lone pair of electrons. It's often transition metals, aluminum, boron, gallium. The Lewis bases have lone pairs on them, and they push the lone pairs into the empty spot on the issue, and they make these complex ions. Now, complex ions have their own equilibrium constant, K sub F, a formation constant. And these Ks are usually very, very big, all right? We've been looking at Kas and Kbs and Ksps in this chapter that are all very small, much less than one, while Kfs are usually much, much, much larger than one. The equilibrium constant comes from this form of the equation, and this is important. The complex ion is the product, and the reactants are whatever you need to make that complex ion. So uh, this is kind of the opposite of KSPs. KSPs, the solid was the reactant, and whatever made the solid, those were the products. But with KFs, it's the opposite. That's a little bit weird. Um, this is an example of a formation constant expression for making this AGCN2 minus one species. And again, these magnitudes are just super, super big that shows that the complex ion really wants to form, all right? If you put silver and cyanide together, it forms right away and it doesn't take any uh, difference. Now, I wanna have uh, a little bit of a review and a little bit of you getting ready for the end of Chem 223, <laughs> uh, for the final exam. And uh, how I'm gonna incorporate that here is that most of these formation constant expressions are written as a net ionic equation or a net ionic reaction. And if it's been a while since you've thought about those, I wanna kind of review this. This was something from Chem 221, if you were with me, and if you weren't, you did it some other time. It's not super difficult. Um, in a net ionic equation, you only show at the end the action of the reaction, which is what I call it. And that cheesy expression just means that you show like the important part about what's being formed. Now in Chem 221, that usually meant that there was a, a solid or a liquid or a gas on the product side. Somehow it was made. Um, and that was, that was the action, all right? In these kind of things, the action of the reaction is the complex ion. And you don't get this right away. So up here, I actually have three equations. Uh, number one, number two, and number three. Now number three is what you see right here, all right? It literally is the formation of the complex ion. But I wanna show you what the actual reaction could look like. Now on this slide, it doesn't show where the silver ion came from. It doesn't show where the cyanide ion came from. 
usually um, these things are associated with like things like nitrate or potassium, which is what I've written up here, but you could have sodium and you could have other kinds of ions. You want to have things that are really water soluble. So equation number one up here is what you could have for the full reaction. All right, like you don't add silver ions by themselves and you don't add cyanide by itself, but you could add silver nitrate, which is a real common source of the silver ion, and you could add potassium cyanide, which is a somewhat common form of potassium. So I'm going to assume that we had silver and potassium here, and you can see what's happening uh, as the silver absorbs the cyanides to make the complex ion, initially there's a negative one charge. So in the total molecular part, you don't see any charges at all. So one of the potassiums would arguably jump ship to form with the complex ion, and the potassium and the nitrate that were left over would make that species. So this is why in Chem 221, we call it the total molecular equation, and it just shows the chemicals you'd need if you wanted to do it. So uh, Stephanie goes home and she goes, wow, I'd really like to make this complex ion. All right, uh, with this right here, it would be difficult to do. But if she knew that there was silver nitrate added and potassium cyanide added, then she could measure out these chemicals that would end up making the complex ion and stuff like that. Question so far? Okay, in the balanced molecular reaction, no charges, no positives, no negatives, anything like that. It literally shows neutral compounds. Neutral compounds are what you can weigh out on a scale, find out how many grams you have or milliliters of its solution, stuff like that. Um, when you're doing a net ionic reaction or net ionic equation, same thing, um, you break up everything that's aqueous into the constituent pieces. So notice here that silver nitrate, which has an AQ next to it, I broke up into silver plus and nitrate ions. I did the same thing for the K plus and the, oops, cyanide, oh, there we go, K plus and the cyanides. Uh, the complex ions stay as one big part in these. However, this K plus will definitely dissociate. And then on the other side, I broke, oops, that shouldn't be. Two, sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> I broke out the K plus and the NO3 like that. So at the second part, which we call the total ionic part in Chem 221, you just want to break apart all the ions, all the pieces that are by themselves. Um, a new addition in this section is you don't break up the complex ions. They want to stay together. But all the potassiums or sodiums, the nitrates, chlorates, whatever, they will absolutely go. Now at this level, you can maybe see here that like here's a nitrate by itself and there's a nitrate by itself. So when you have an ion on both reactant and product side, you can cancel it, all right? This is kind of like what you do in math. If you had an X on both sides or you had two on both sides, you could subtract a two or X. Well, here we're essentially subtracting a nitrate from both sides, so it's out of here. You can also see that there's one, two potassiums on the product side, and there's two potassiums right there on the reactant side. So the potassiums and the nitrates are spectators. We call them spectator ions in Chem 221. That just means that they're not part of the chemistry happening, all right? They're not involved with the action of the reaction, all right? So finally, what's left, which is this reaction that I wrote, better uh, listed right there in the slide, that's the true net ionic reaction, all right? It shows just the species which are making something interesting. It does not include the spectator ions, which here I said was potassium and nitrate. This is an example of a net ionic equation analysis, if you will. Oh, any questions on that part? Finally, in the net ionic part, there's usually some charges running around. And I want to also reintroduce the fact that if you have a balanced reaction, not only are the atoms balanced, but the charges are balanced as well. So the complex ion in this example has a minus one charge. 
So the product side has an overall minus one charge. And if we've done a good job here, the reactant side should have the same charge. It should be minus one. So if you look, it's two times minus one for the cyanides, plus one for the silver. So minus two plus one, it also has a minus one charge. So a good balanced reaction has not only the atoms balanced, but also the charges. And that's kind of another cool thing here. That will actually help us uh, in an upcoming chapter, as we'll see. So I hope that's mostly review, but again, if you have questions on anything, this is a great time to ask questions. Sweet. So, back to your regular schedule of programming. Formation constants, only for weird things, which are complex ions. And again, complex ions, usually a Lewis acid center with some Lewis bases around it. They look weird, but they're very product favorite, and that just means that they form really readily. Here's a table of some complex ion formation constants, and you can see these are all big numbers, all right? After we went through all the Ka's and Kb's, which were really small, these numbers, to me anyway, just look massive. All of these, the complex ion that's listed is the product, and whatever goes into it would be the reactants. So here's this weird cadmium iodide complex. If you were gonna write an expression here, this would be the product you'd have cadmium plus two and four iodide minus ones on the reactant side. So again, whatever goes into it would be your reactants. The complex ion would be the product. Um, and again, these are usually written as net ionic reactions, so you're not seeing the sodiums, potassiums, nitrates, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, we'll talk about temperature dependence in a little bit. But questions? They can be really helpful um, sometimes though, and that's another thing. I make them sound sometimes almost draconian and how they messed up chemist reactions and stuff, but they can actually be really helpful. Um, silver chloride is a white solid and it's very insoluble and it will coat the, um, the, the outside of glassware if you're having it used and it can be really messy. So once in a while in a lab you may have seen some glassware with like a white film on it. Almost inevitably that's silver chloride. It's hard to get off. You can scrape it and stuff. However, the complex ion between ammonia and silver forms pretty readily. And this is one way that you can get rid of that film chemically. So instead of scraping it and stuff like that, adding some ammonia will make that happen. So as an example of that, silver chloride dissociates into silver plus and chloride. And you can look up that KSP for this reaction. Right? Remember in a KSP, the solid is the reactant and the ions that go into it are the products. Well, you can do the same thing with a complex ion. In this case, the complex ion is this AgNH32 plus thing. Now to figure this out, you put the ions and stuff that goes into it over on the reactant side. So that would be silver plus for this part and two ammonias. And I hope you see where we're going with this. If you add these two reactions together, the silver as a product here will cancel the silver as a reactant here. So you'll end up, excuse me, with silver chloride and two ammonias, excuse me, making chloride and the complex ion. And you can figure out what's happening from there. And it's relatively more product favored than silver chloride, so it can actually dissolve your white film silver chloride pretty readily. When solutions of silver nitrate and sodium chloride are mixed, insoluble silver chloride precipitates from solution. That's what'll stick to your glassware, this white solid, if you don't clean it up. When we add ammonia to the mixture, however, the precipitate re-dissolves. When ammonia is added to a mixture of solid and aqueous silver chloride, the ammonia serves as a Lewis base. The complex ion formed consists of two ammonia molecules bound to each silver ion. Formation of the complex lowers the concentration of silver in solution, which changes the solubility equilibrium. 
as the silver is pulled out of this reaction because it's making the complex ion, the silver chloride is going to make this reaction go to the product side. If you remove something, the reaction shifts to the side you remove it from by Le Chatelier's principle. So the silver is being pulled out by the ammonia to make this thing. That makes the silver chloride try to make more silver. So the process, it ends up dissolving silver chloride. Now, if you wanted to make silver chloride, you don't want it to be anywhere near ammonia because ammonia will make your solid totally disappear as the complex ion forms. On the other hand, if you have glassware, which is dirty with kind of a film stuff, heck yeah, little ammonia knocks it right off, which is kind of a cool thing, so. So complex ions can't be cool too, big surprise. Questions on? All right, so that's it for this chapter. Uh, like I babbled about the other day, this isn't what I consider to be the most exciting chapter of all time. But to make up for it, we're going into what is probably the most exciting chapter of all time. And that's was all going to be on something called entropy. Now, entropy is something that I've kind of danced around a little bit in previous lectures in 221 and Chem 222. And I've intentionally tried to not talk about it because once I start talking about it, it's kind of hard sometimes for me to shut up about it. So without talking about what it actually is, I'd love to show you this little graphic, which I just adore. This is the Department of Entropy. All right. And if you look at this, oh my gosh, the door is off the hinge. All right. There's like books under the desk because it won't stand up. There's a hole in the floor. This isn't lit up. There's a broken window. It's 1967. Summer of love. Anyway, the stocks are going down. You can see all the craziness which is in there. And believe it or not, all of those things are symptoms of of entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder in the universe, all right? And it's an amazingly profound subject that is uh, still just continues to baffle me today. If you've ever lived with someone, a parent, another sibling, whatever, a significant other, and you are a slob and they're like, mm, clean your room or whatever, right? Well, from now on, you can just say, oh, I'm just contributing to entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about later. Believe it or not, messiness is a thing you can measure. It's a type of entropy. And you might be thinking, what the heck are you talking about, Russell? So here's an example of how entropy works, all right? Like, here's a bunch of papers, all right, and they're kind of together, <laughs> kind of organized and stuff like that. All right, if I throw them on the ground, right, they're no longer organized, it's a mess, all right? And that is actually an example of entropy. Cheesy, corny, crowd tricks, absolutely. However, it is entropy. Entropy is literally things becoming more messy. Now, notice, I can get down and I can pick all the papers up, <laughs> Try to do my best to put them all back together, probably not in the same order, but it took me energy to do it. It was easy to throw them on the ground, all right? But it's difficult to put them back into order. So this is actually something that's arguably more important than enthalpy, the heat we've been talking about, heat given off, heat absorbed, all that kind of jazz. Entropy is super important, not just to you and your world to justify if you have a messy room and stuff like that. It's actually important in terms of chemical processes too. So get ready. This chapter is quite a bit different than the other chapters that we've looked at so far. Now, a quick review, all right? Since Chem 222 and a little bit in 221, we've talked about the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics. And I want to revisit that real fast. We're going to talk here about enthalpy again. We'll talk about entropy, some stuff like that. That's thermodynamics. And you can argue that thermodynamics is all about reactions that either get the thumbs up, they're going to happen, or a thumbs down, they're not going to happen. All right? That's kind of thermodynamics in a nutshell. And I would be like tarred and feathered by thermodynamicists for saying that. But more or less, that's kind of what it's all about. It's a yes or a no applied to things. Kinetics says how fast or slow the reaction is going to be. So some reactions will get the thumbs up from thermodynamics. It's going to happen. 
But kinetics makes it so slow that in our human lifetime, it's never going to happen. And I want you to remember these things as we go through this section, because we'll talk about all kinds of entropies and stuff, and how the universe is going to end up and stuff. It's hard to say. But I want you to remember that there's also the kinetic argument, how long it's going to take to do some of these things. Will it take a million, billion, trillion years? Or will it happen in milliseconds? All right. These are two different fields of science, and they both play off each other. They're both really important in this section. But um, to really understand some of these things thoroughly, you need to think about both of them. So keep the kinetics versus thermodynamics argument in the back of your mind. Okay. This is an uh, example of something we looked at in Chem 222. It was talking about the energy of activation how reactants go to products. And we talked about how this energy gap right here was called the energy of activation. And as this gap from reactants to products got bigger, 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 reactions got slower and slower and slower. On the other hand, if you have a very small gap, if it's not even up, it could be down, then you could have reactions that happen super fast, all right? Um, Reactants to products is thermodynamics, all right? And usually if you go up in energy, which means endothermic, as we're going to talk about, those are usually the reactions that are not as likely. On the other hand, if products are lower than the reactants they started with, those are exothermic reactions, and those usually mean that the reaction will go. However, you could have a reactants to products exothermic reaction, which should happen, but with a huge energy of activation. And those would take so long to accomplish that it probably isn't going to happen in our lifetimes. Here is people on the, in the earth and stuff, you know, we have only so much time to think about things. Uh, anyway, this is how these two play off each other. All right. Sometimes you'll have very fast reactions that will happen really quickly. On the other hand, sometimes you'll have really slow reactions, huge energies of activations that won't happen very readily, but they will happen eventually. Any questions on that? Now, will the two of you please get out of here and leave me alone? You're wasting energy, Mr. Plummer. Relax. This is from The Outer Limits. Cheesy, but really cool action science fiction from the 60s of all things. Let me tell you why that just gives me the chills when I see it, all right? Thermodynamics and kinetics. Will the two of you get out of here and leave me alone? That's what I feel like a lot of times. I don't want to know all this stuff. But once you see it, and the alien guy there had to show the scientist and stuff. But anyway, yeah, energy and time. That's what it's all about. They're both really important. It's a good reminder, if nothing else, about the importance of the things around you and stuff. So anyway, yes, no more bad science fiction references. So let's go back to thermodynamics a little bit. Let's review what we've seen in Chem 221 and Chem 222 up to this point. In Chem 221, I introduced the idea of the first law of thermodynamics. There are three laws. This is the only one we've looked at so far. And in the first law of thermodynamics, it basically just says that energy can't be created or destroyed. So all the energy that's around us is all that we're ever going to have, all right? And we talked in Chem 221 about the system and the surroundings a little bit. The system is what you're looking at, and the surroundings is everything else around your system. So if we have sodium chloride and, so and sodium hydroxide come together, lots of energy given off. That would be the system, all right, the HCl and the sodium hydroxide. But the water around it, the beaker that holds the water, the air around the beaker, all of those things would be the surroundings. Usually, of course, the system is the more important part, but the surroundings really needs to be taken care of. 
Now, energy, it's a change in energy. The delta means change, final minus initial. And energy comes in two forms that are really important, heat and work. Now, work is mostly um, is a big part about physics, and in physics you'll do things with springs and forces and stuff. Um, chemists mostly focus on the heat part, because that's energy given off, energy absorbed, stuff like that. And if your heat is transferred at constant pressure, which is like always in our class, then uh, heat and enthalpy are the same thing. So in Chem 221 through Chem 223, the energy, the delta E, has basically been all about the enthalpy because we're almost always at constant pressure, all right, one atmosphere. Uh, we don't worry about the work in chemistry. We're more about the uh, heat energy and stuff like that. So that's kind of what we've been at so far. And so far, of course, enthalpy has been the main player. We've talked about exothermic, the negative delta H's, endothermic, the positive delta H's, those kind of things. Any questions on that? Okay. I can't resist these kind of things. And now, maximum energy. This is from supposedly the worst movie ever made, Plan 9 from Outer Space, Maximum Energy, and this freaky guy was coming down to take people. You don't have to watch my shows, definitely. Anyway, enthalpy, Chem 221 is where we hit it a lot. We'll hit it again here. Um, remember that negative delta H's are exothermic, and negative delta H energy is released. If you feel a beaker and it's hot, exothermic. All right, the reaction has given off energy to make it happen. On the other hand, a lot of reactions are endothermic. You'd have a positive delta H. Those take energy from the outside to the inside. So you feel the beaker and it feels cold, endothermic, all right? Um, that's definitely the most important. It's usually listed kilojoules per mole, sometimes joules per gram, different things. Some kind of energy in joules or kilojoules, usually per mole, sometimes per gram. Um, in Chem 221, we talked about Hess's law. Hess's law is when you take um, uh, several reactions and combine them. And even more importantly, if you know all of the enthalpies of formation, which are just numbers like these right here, then the enthalpies of all the products minus the enthalpies of all the reactants was one way to find the enthalpy. In Chem 222, we did bond enthalpies. So we took bonds broken minus bonds formed to figure out the different energies. Um, so you take the individual bonds if you know the Lewis structures. This is a very fast review. You never have to memorize any of these numbers. You'll have tables and stuff associated with them. The delta H values can be positive or negative. Again, this means that making ammonia, you get energy out on making it. Any questions on this? There's no, there's no dumb answers, because we haven't looked at this for a while, obviously. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is what's called a spontaneous reaction. Now, when I think about spontaneous, I'm thinking like, hey, let's all skip school and go hike on a trail right now. Woohoo! So we all go to our cars. That's to me what spontaneous means, like as a human being. But in science, we have a different re uh, definition of what spontaneous means. Um, <clears throat> Thermodynamics will always ask if a reaction will occur or not occur, the thumbs up or thumbs down. And if you have a product favored reaction, and I use that term intentionally because equilibrium constants greater than one or product favored, these reactions are called spontaneous, which means that they will occur. So the thumbs up I was talking about, that means that that is gonna be a spontaneous reaction. It doesn't mean that it happens right now, spur of the moment. Anything with time is kinetics, all right? But spontaneous just means that that reaction will occur. Now, most product favored reactions are exothermic, negative delta H's. We'll talk more about this later. It, up until this chapter, we've assumed that exothermic reactions are the spontaneous ones, but we'll talk, there's a little bit more to it than that. A non-spontaneous reaction is a reaction which won't occur. 
So if this is, if a spontaneous reaction is product favored and K is greater than one, then a non-spontaneous reaction would be reactant favored and have a K less than one, okay? So we're talking here of another way to talk about what product favored means. Product favored just means, heck yeah, your reaction's gonna go, thumbs up. Non-spontaneous means the reaction will occur. It doesn't mean spur of the moment, which is what I always think about as a human being when I talk about this, but it does mean that it will occur given enough time. The activation energy still has to be there, so that can make the reaction fast or slow. Questions on that part? Now, spontane spontaneity doesn't mean anything about time, all right? So it doesn't mean we're gonna drop what we're doing and do something else, all right? That's more of a thing about kinetics, all right? Spontaneity in thermodynamics world just basically is thumbs up if it's spontaneous, product favored K greater than one, or thumbs down, that would be non-spontaneous, K less than one, reactive favor, okay? That's a little weird, I know, but, um, and again, spontaneity in a thermodynamic world can mean really fast or slow. Fast and slow is where kinetics pops in. That's where the energy of activation is important, or activation energy. Questions so far? Okay, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can't be created or destroyed, doesn't say anything about spontaneity, all right? First law just applies to all systems, all right? So you could have a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction, and it would still be okay under first law. First law just says you're not going to create or destroy any energy, all right? If you know that something is spontaneous or non-spontaneous, you can start to adjust, but first law is independent of all this spontaneity stuff, so. Okay, uh, let's look at some examples. If I leave an iron nail outside and it rains, after a while, it'll start to become rusty, all right? Rust is a natural thing that happens with iron if it's exposed. Going from iron, pure iron, to rust, which is iron three oxide, is spontaneous, all right? It's gonna happen if I leave it outside, et cetera, et cetera. Oh man, my iron nail is rusty. I want it to become non-spontaneous. I want it to become back to iron. Well, that's not gonna happen by itself, all right? I'm gonna have to do some chemical magic to make that happen. You can add different chemicals to make the iron three oxide go back to iron, but it's not gonna be something that's gonna happen by itself. So we would say that this reaction is spontaneous going from the iron nail to the rusty nail. We would say it was non-spontaneous going from the rusty nail back to the iron nail. If you eat a gummy bear, <laughs> that would be spontaneous, easy, digested, stuff like that. Oh, I shouldn't have had that extra gummy bear. Well, getting the gummy bear back to the gummy bear, uh, probably not gonna happen. You can probably fill in all the details, which are kind of morbid, but anyway. Yeah, you, the, these things are often one direction spontaneous and often in the other direction would be non-spontaneous. Now, I wanna go back to kinetics again, because it's really important. We're gonna see that diamonds going to graphite, and just as a quick review, diamonds and graphite are both forms of carbon. Diamonds going to graphite is thermodynamically favored. It's spontaneous. So if you collect diamonds and you have a bunch at home and you listen to this, you're like, oh my God, my diamonds are all gonna go to granite. Sell, sell, sell. Hold on, because diamonds going to graphite is spontaneous, it's going to happen. But kinetically, it's incredibly slow, all right? Lifetimes will go by before any of the diamonds will show graphite formation. Uh, diamonds to graphite has an incredibly large energy of activation. And so it's not something that's gonna happen in our lifetimes or even our children's 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 lifetime, all right? It's very, very slow. On the other hand, you got a piece of paper, you wanna light it on fire, go for it. Uh, that's going to happen 
thermodynamically, spontaneous, absolutely, going and having it burn will be no problem. And obviously, if you light it up, it's gonna happen pretty fast. So both of these reactions are, in this world, spontaneous. They're both gonna happen, but the kinetics is super slow here and super fast right here. So think about that as we go through this section. Yeah, Chief. Don't diamonds also form really, really slow um, under pressure? millions of years, would you say that they became diamonds more quickly or that they go to graphite? Oh, wow, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> uh, uh, I, my geology is not very good, so. Oh, uh, geology, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, um, for what it's worth, I'm trying to get access to, there, in Gresham, there's a place that makes diamonds now, and I'm trying to get connections in there so we could have a tour one day. I don't, I don't know where, but um, that would be a cool question to ask. Gee, if I had to guess, wow. Yeah, they're both really slow. Yeah, and really right? hard to do, <laughs> so I'm not sure. I, I, I would guess that probably going from, from diamonds back to graphite would be easier than graphite to diamonds, but honestly, I don't know. So that's a really good question. Awesome. Excellent, excellent questions. Oh. Other questions? Um, there's lots of spontaneous reactions around us. And one example is, again, we're going to go back to good old water. But water is also a good example because it shows how some spontaneous reactions are temperature dependent. So let's say that you have a temperature under zero degrees Celsius and you leave liquid water out, it will spontaneously start to freeze, all right? It'll turn into ice and stuff like that. On the other hand, you take your ice out and you leave it on the counter, assuming your house is warmer than zero degrees Celsius, the ice will melt back to liquid water. So this shows that spontaneity is temperature dependent. If your temperature is greater than zero, then the ice will spontaneously go to liquid water. The liquid will not spontaneously go to ice if you're above zero degrees Celsius. On the other hand, if you were less than zero degrees Celsius, then the water will spontaneously go to ice. Ice will not spontaneously go to water, again, if you're under zero degrees Celsius. So there's a temperature component of all of this stuff too. All of the equilibrium constants we've seen so far, Ka's, Kb's, Ksp's, Kf's today, they all should anyway have some kind of temperature next to them because temperature is a part of equilibrium. It'll help decide which one is more likely to occur than not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> reversible reactions is something else I wanna hit on here really fast. If you truly have a reversible reaction, all right, then you can go either direction, reactions to products or products to reactants. And if it truly is reversible, then everything is put back in the same way as you reverse, all right? And if you think about it, this is an example of energy being transferred from the system to the surroundings. Here's an example of the temperature going from the surroundings to the system and whatever. And there are apparently some examples, but it's very, very rare. So most of the time, uh, you don't have this kind of process. Like earlier when I threw the papers on the ground, all right, they went around a little bit. I probably didn't put them back in the same way that I had them before I threw them on the ground. So the order was a little bit different. This is, that's an analogy of how difficult it is to truly have a reversible reaction. Um, we talked about iron nails uh, becoming rusty, and that one I think you could have them go back from rusty nails to iron. On the other hand, your gummy bear, after it went through your system and was digested, I would argue that would be pretty difficult to get that back to the original gummy bear. So just kind of all these energy things to think about. All right. Irreversible reactions are more common, and irreversibility has different levels and stuff. Um, but you can imagine that sometimes things are easier than one or the other. So here's a beautiful car. It was let out for a long time, and it's a rusty, you know, just a junk pile. However, you take it home, you buff it out, put more paint on it, etc., etc. Yeah, you can make it go like this, but it's not going to be easy. You could argue that there is a point where these kind of transformations become irreversible. 
And in chemistry, this is what we're thinking about all the time. Okay, so the directionality of a reaction is what scientists think about when they start getting into thermodynamics. And scientists have always wondered, like if you look at all the reactions ever known, ever studied, all right, how probable is it that you're going to have a spontaneous reaction, a reaction that will occur? And it's interesting because when scientists have studied all the reactions that have known so far, probability definitely suggests that you will have a product favored and spontaneous reaction if the end result is dispersal. Now dispersal means that you went from a concentrated form to a less concentrated form. You can have two types of dispersal. Earlier I showed you matter dispersal, so my papers were more all over the place than they were when I threw them down. That's an example of matter, G, matter dispersal. I went from a concentrated organized matter system to an unorganized system. But you can also have energy dispersal. You can have like a lot of energy, like in a gummy bear, for example, and as you eat it, the energy goes through your system. The energy is dispersed over a larger area. So if you have a reaction that has energy dispersal, concentrated energy to dispersed energy, matter dispersal, concentrated matter to lots of pieces of matter, or even better, if you have both energy and matter dispersal, these are the reactions which usually get a thumbs up from thermodynamics. And this is pretty important because all the reactions are known, all right? Acids and bases and uh, TNT and, uh, you know, caffeine, whatever, all right? All of those reactions uh, almost inevitably have one, both, or all of these things happen. They'll have matter being dispersed to bigger molecules make smaller molecules. They'll have energy dispersed, stuff like that. Boltzmann uh, was a famous scientist who was the first person to realize that. And on his tombstone, he has this equation which has to do with entropy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, Boltzmann gets some credit here for figuring these things out. So, let's say that you're Saturday market this weekend. And someone comes up to you and says, hey, uh, you're in chemistry, you should know this. And blah, 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 they ask you some random question out of the third blue sky, all right? And you've never heard of most of this stuff. In the back of your mind, if you think that whatever they're talking about has energy concentrated to more dispersed, or and or matter concentrated more dispersed, probably it's gonna happen, all right? It's not 100% but probability says those are the reactions that get the thumbs up from thermodynamics. You're finally talking about magic. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> These are based on lots of observations and experiments and stuff like that, but it feels like magic. Gee, it totally does. And on that emotional level, I am right there with you. But uh, as a scientist, yeah, these are all experiment-based and stuff, so okay. <laughs> Magic is just science that hasn't been figured out yet. Yeah. Oh. All right, let's move on. Consider a pair of flasks, one containing gas molecules, the other completely empty. If the flasks are connected at their mouths, gas in the filled flask will move spontaneously to the empty flask by its molecular motions. Eventually, the distribution of molecules will be even throughout the flasks. The final state in which the matter is more dispersed is much more probable than the initial undispersed state. So in this example, you've got two glass pieces connected by a little stopper. Initially, you have a gas on this side, and this side is a vacuum. If you open the two up, it's like a duh, probably, but anyway, yeah, of course, the gas is going to go in here, and at the end, when everything is stabilized, you'll have just as much gas on this side as you have gas on that side. That's an example of matter dispersal. Making things less organized is something that's observed in science. And if you need to justify again to your mom or your significant other or whoever that it's okay to have a messy room, matter dispersal. Because instead of having everything organized into closets and little cases, it's natural to have things kind of be a little bit messy. You are actually part of thermodynamics when you do it. You're 
long parallel unit when a significant other or whatever may not appreciate the thermodynamic argument of it. Hello, science, cool. So, which of these questions, which of these processes do you think would represent matter dispersal? All right? So cleaning your messy room, conducting, condensing gaseous water, crystallizing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, matter dispersal, matter very concentrated to matter being all over the place. If you have a messy room and you clean your stuff, put it all in the drawers, is that dispersal or is that like anti-dispersal? Anti. Anti, that's right. You're making your room more organized. Matter dispersal is about having this stuff go all over the place. Now, this one is kind of interesting. You're taking gaseous water, gas all over the place, and making a liquid. Now, gases almost always have more volume than liquids. So believe it or not, this is not matter dispersal either, because you're going from gas all over the place to liquid, all right? Liquid is very concentrated. That's not gonna be dispersing a mass. Crystallizing a solid from a solution. Again, in a solution, you'll have the pieces all over the solution. You're making them into those tight, uh, simple cubic body center, cubic face center, cubic things we talked about in Chem 222. That's not making matter dispersal. That's actually organizing your matter. However, eating dinner, mmm, pizza, whatever, <laughs> fill in your favorite food, right? Concentrated forms of food, eating it down, that's the dispersal. Human beings are great for matter dispersal because when you eat something or drink something or anything like that, even breathe in things, uh, a lot of times that will then disperse the matter around pretty good. So, um, this is a chemical example. In this example, you're starting with water, nitrogen, and chromium uh, uh, three oxide, and you're making ammonium dichromate, the volcano. Wow. And this is taking lots of chemicals and making them into one chemical. That's not dispersing it either. That's making it more concentrated. Okay. Stored chemical potential energy is released from reactant molecules in an exothermic reaction. This energy spreads out or disperses over the product molecules and the molecules in the surroundings. This is an example of why exothermic reactions are usually the spontaneous ones. Now in an exothermic reaction, this little thing right here is like the system, the chemicals that are actually doing something. And in the process, they release energy. Well, the energy was stored inside the system chemicals and then it's released. So you can see like the, if these are water molecules, they're a little bit more higher energy. They're a red color now, woohoo, instead of this, the blue. And that energy goes out a little bit to the even further ones out. So the energy is dispersed. So every time you have an exothermic reaction, you have a good chance that that's gonna happen because as the energy is released, the energy is dispersed. And again, when you look at all the reactions now, energy and or matter dispersal is what you want to predict if it's gonna occur. So most exothermic reactions will occur. Now, so these exothermic reactions just release a lot of energy. And remember, exothermic negative delta H values, okay? So if you have a release of this energy, then the energy goes out and it happens. And so most of the time, it's the exothermic ones which are gonna make, be the ones that are gonna happen. They're gonna have product favorite Ks. So up until this chapter, we have basically assumed, or I've helped you assume, that negative delta H exothermic reactions are the ones that occur. And most of the time, that is correct. But on Friday, I don't have time today, on Friday, I'm gonna show you some examples of endothermic reactions that occur. Remember, if you see something happens, that means it's spontaneous. But if it's endothermic, if the container feels cold, then there must be something else going on that's outside of the endothermic exothermic process. And we'll talk about that, I think, on Friday. Okay, any questions on any of this? Have a great day, thanks for being here.